Ash. All right. <laughs> Hi guys, welcome to the Lunge and Lift podcast. Today we are very excited to be rejoined by a special guest, Mr. Luke Hall, to talk things VO2 max, energy systems development, and go through some testing that Robin and myself have done in the last couple of days, which we're very excited to dig into. Um, before we get started, as ever, just a quick shout out to our sponsor, Wit Fitness. Um, we're very grateful to be associated with the brand and please check out the website www.wit-fitness.com and use discount code LL15. Mm. There you go. Even Luke's representing today uh, if you're on YouTube. And uh, yeah, let's get cracking. Luke, how are you, mate? I'm good, thanks, man. Yeah, it's good to be back. Obviously, uh, different scenarios to when we last chatted as well. Mm. Exactly. We've got something a bit more specific to go through today. So as a bit of context, uh, Rob and I this week have done a VO2 max, which Luke and PH Nutrition are offering at Wit House London. And yeah, rather than butcher it myself, Luke, can you talk us through the tests and the protocol so the listeners get an understanding of what we've just gone through? Yeah, of course. So obviously kind of with VO2 max test, what you're kind of looking for is that kind of maximal um, oxygen consumption. So the test itself, what we do, we use a device called a VO2 master, which is basically just a breath analysis device, right? So it records um, the amount of oxygen present in inspired air um, and obviously kind of breathing frequency and tidal volume. So the amount of air that you're breathing out as well. We like to pair that up with a moxie monitor, which basically measures muscle oxygen saturation at the muscle, which is a good kind of indicator of the supply and demand of oxygen at the muscle. So we use the VO2 master to look at oxygen coming into the lungs and then the moxie to look at, okay, when the oxygen's in there, how well is it being delivered to the muscle and then how well is the muscle using it? And so for that test, what we like to do is something called a ramp test, which is basically a test that ramps up in intensity and takes you to maximal effort, ideally. Obviously, kind of, if you're not in the right kind of headspace, then that might happen. But that's what we've done. We've taken the both of you guys over the past couple of days in a increasing intensity test all the way up to maximal intensity um, and had a little look at what's under the hood. Awesome. Yeah, so just to, to get a visual for people who aren't on YouTube or who are just listening in, um, Rob and I, we basically had to wear a Bane-like face mask to measure the air coming in and out of our mouth and nose and also had the Moxie, which is basically a wireless device taped to our thigh, um, which I think uses infrared to, to measure that blood oxygen uh, muscle oxygen saturation right and it's all it syncing wirelessly to luke's ipad so you can see everything happen in real time and yeah pumps out some pretty cool data mm -hmm. um so i guess one question i had for you luke is why is the protocol structured like that ace so it's structured in a way that ultimately allows us to almost run across all your heart rate training zones. So these kind of heart rate training zones are designed to kind of be indicators of the intensity of the training. And we obviously know that kind of higher intensity training is more kind of anaerobic. And I'm doing that in uh, quotation marks for people that are listening, just because there's a lot of kind of debate going on about whether all training is aerobic and that kind of thing. So we're using kind of some old models there. Um, but basically what we want to look at is take you from your kind of low and slow aerobic activity, see kind of how you're working there all the way up to that ramp test to the maximal intensity to look at anaerobic capacity there as well. And obviously, if we're looking at VO2 max, that's maximal amount of oxygen that we can consume. And when you're doing your kind of low and slow stuff, you're not necessarily going to be consuming oxygen to your maximal capacity because you don't need to. So by taking it up to that high intensity, that failure, we get a really good picture of kind of how you go across all intensities. And then we can give you those kind of heart rate training zones and get a good measure of the maximal capacity that you're capable of as well. Good. And is this the sort of thing that we should retest to see if our training's being effective and our limiters are changing? Or is it something that's quite fixed that is just, it is what it is? 
Definitely. It's one of those retest ones. So VO2 max, me and Rob were chatting about this um, yesterday. It's one of those where the actual number itself is pretty much pointless when you're looking to guide training, but it's a fantastic kind of measure of progress. And so what we like to do with the results, which we're definitely going to dive into with the both of you guys, is look at, okay, what was your VO2 max there? What was limiting it? And then obviously we can talk about interventions from nutrition and training to put into place. And then a retest is a way of kind of a confirming that the interventions and the training works. So the chances are, if we find a limiter and we work on it, that VO2 max is going to go up and your capacity is going to go up and your performance is going to go up. Um, but it's also a case to then look at, okay, so we fixed that limiter. Now what's holding you back? What do we need to uh, work on then? Brilliant. So without further ado, let's dig into it, mate. Um, mm -hmm. Let's go through some results. Where do you want to start? Okay, let's we'll start with Rob first because he's been the uh, the guy that's been doing the most kind of endurance work recently, yeah. right? So for those on YouTube, uh, you can see the report up on the screen. So Luke is now sharing it. So if you're not on YouTube and you're just listening to us, do check us out. Search Lunge and Lift on YouTube and uh, look at the time into this podcast and then get stuck in here and really uh, so see some interesting graphs, shall we say. So Luke... Yeah, I mean, I don't know if people find graphs as interesting as I do, but let's definitely dive into it anyway. So um, what we've got here from Rob's test. So Rob, just for kind of the context there, um, as I sort of mentioned, he's been doing a lot more endurance stuff. He's prepping for a triathlon, as I'm sure everyone kind of knows, because he probably won't shut up about it. Mm. Uh, but because of that, in terms of the uh, test, we carried it out for Rob on a concept to bike erg. So we wanted to make it kind of as sport specific as possible. Didn't necessarily have access to a treadmill and uh, apparently Rob's swimming is not efficient enough to test that yet. <laughs> so we were like, hey, let's hop on a bike. And so what we did with Rob was basically um, we carried out a test that was that ramp test, but we made the intervals a little bit longer than with Ash just because his discipline is gonna be a little bit longer than most of the stuff that Ash might be doing in the gym or playing football, <laughs> that kind of thing. So what we, we ran it with basically a nice steady warm up, um, and then three minute intervals where we would just increase the power output by 50 watts every three minutes, nice and easy, all the way until he couldn't hold it anymore. And so these are kind of the graphs that we get. The first thing to kind of look at up here, which everybody wants to know is the maximal metrics. And we've got this VO2 max score of 50.4, milliliters per kilogram per minute so that's basically in this test what was the maximal amount of sustained oxygen consumption that rob could kind of hold for a decent amount of time and that was this kind of score of 50 you can compare it to others so it's kind of in that excellent category which is not bad at all um but as i said kind of earlier vo2 max the number itself is pointless apart from a good old ego boost for rob obviously mm. to say he's excellent okay. um what what I like to dive into is kind of the why behind it, what's holding it back and that kind of thing. So obviously you get this kind of initial super useful data. So personalized tailored heart rate training zones are fantastic to have as well. And Rob, what we were doing, we, was, we were comparing it to your Garmin, right? Mm. And so interestingly, we kind of found that for Rob, his Garmin predicted a VO2 max of, what was it, around 51? Kind of yeah, my cycling VO2 max is 51, so... There we go. So we measured it about the same and heart rate training zones given by the Garmin and that kind of thing as well are pretty similar to this sort of stuff, right, as well, Rob? Yeah, so this this was what I found was most interesting because all scenes with cycling, running, not necessarily swimming at the moment, but with cycling, running, I have to work within certain zones. So what's been really nice to see is my predicted zones and my like what the Garmin has said I am, I'm actually working in the correct zones. And that's obviously important when I'm trying to say progress because when you don't want to work too hard or you don't want to work not hard enough. So that it's it's at least I've been within the right metrics, and especially when I know we're going to probably touch into it a little bit later, but when we discuss maybe like zone two work and stuff like that, a lot of time we want to make sure we we where how far we can kind of get up to how high our heart rate can go so it's it's an interesting it was an interesting test and it's but it was a really it was a really nice thing to go through to see that my results aren't too dissimilar to what i've been training for the past say couple of months so it's good 
which is sweet. Yeah, it's super useful. So there we go. As, as we kind of said there, we got the training zones to kind of go off and we're going to dive into that kind of zone two stuff and the benefits of accurate learning and accurate training zones for that as well. But let's scroll down and let's look at those interesting graphs that Rob has said that we mm. have. So what we've got here, just to kind of run through the graphs, we've got a standard kind of VO2, which is the blue line um, and heart rate. And then we've got step zones. So for those of you that aren't um, on YouTube, listen, on Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You kind of see as the exercise intensity increased, so does heart rate nice and linearly, and then so does VO2 as well, which you'd kind of expect, right? As exercise intensity is increasing, um, VO2 consumption is increasing, heart rate is increasing, so that heart is working hard to pump blood to the muscles and for that blood to basically provide the option for the muscles to produce the energy they need to carry out the exercise. Nice and simple. Um, the graph is standard. It's what you'd expect. There's no kind of issues with regards to that VO2 and heart rate one. But as we kind of dive a little deeper, we've got a graph looking at basically ventilation. So this graph here, um, what we measure as well as VO2 and as well as heart rate is breathing frequency and tidal volume and then just ventilation in general, which is essentially the amount of air that Rob was breathing. And obviously that is kind of relevant to VO2 because oxygen is in that air that he's consuming. And what we see that's really interesting with um, Rob is essentially his breathing frequency follows a similar trend to um, VO2 itself. So kind of steady increase all the way, all the way, all the way until he gets to really high kind of working intensities. And we see this spike in breathing frequency, <clears throat> which is basically saying, Rob is now hyperventilating, which I'm sure anyone that's done kind of maximal intensity, that's high intensity interval training, you know that when you get to that higher intensities, breathing starts to just go <sighs> fast, right? And it's not necessarily that effective. And we realize that, hey, Rob, it's not that effective because when we're looking at um, breathing frequency, you'd expect I'm breathing more, so I'm going to be pulling more oxygen in we found that not to be the case with Rob, right? At that higher intensities. And that is the same for most people. Like it's not gonna be efficient, um, but there's potentially kind of room to work on, which is an interesting part of training and strength conditioning that I think is gonna come more to the fore soon is kind of how do we improve breathing? How do we improve our efficiency at all breathing at those higher intensities to make sure that, hey, we actually do pull in as much oxygen, more oxygen, even when our breathing frequency kind of spikes, which is totally natural. So there's that kind of interesting thing to look at there and stuff to improve upon. Um, and so it could be a case of Rob kind of diving into more breathing techniques, more diaphragmatic breathing, and um, potentially kind of one thing that um, could be useful is nasal breathing in a warm up to almost warm up the diaphragm as well to get it moving. Because what nasal breathing does, right, is it kind of limits the amount of air oxygen that you can pull in. So diaphragm maybe needs to work a little bit harder for that, um, which could just be a good way to warm up the diaphragm exactly that so that it's more ready to kind of respond to these higher intensity things that you're attacking so that could be one but i'm a nutritionist mm. so i'm gonna kind of not give blanket advice in terms mm. of strength condition and breathing techniques and just say i think it's going to be a really interesting um area of performance that is going to come to the fore soon nice with before we move on to the other graphs so just two yeah. questions uh about this now the first one, as you can see in the step test, so for those that aren't watching, um, every 50 watts, so basically every three minutes, it went up 50 watts. So you just imagine a staircase, and then if you go throughout the full duration, it's you see across the graph, it's a three minute block. And then as soon as I failed, essentially, you just see the drop off goes down as a cool, cool down. Now, two questions with this bit. You see the, the, the peaks. Now, I would have thought they would have been just after the increase in intensity. Now, I remember doing the test. I did talk, which probably didn't help because obviously talking, you're going to change, uh, say, breathing pattern and stuff like that. But is that, I, I would have thought my heart rate would have, uh, oh, so, right, so the blue one's breathing rate, isn't it? Uh, what's the blue one? Because that's that peaks, so that's not the heart blue rate. On the yeah, the top one, the, the first the first graph, so just discussing the first one. So the way the way my heart rate shoots, or the, sorry, the blue line goes up and down. I would have thought that would have been after the step up rather than before the step, because that's where the change occurs. Is that is that normal? 
Uh, that's ultimately that's one of those that that is um, down to kind of your breathing frequency as well, and it could almost be a case of you sort of preempting the change in step and right. um, getting ready to do that. It may be subconsciously. Mm -hmm. uh, we can sort of see on this first graph, like for the first couple of steps, you do sort of see the heart rate does jump up after each step. So, mm -hmm. for example, this first one here, we see a big jump. This one is kind of found that steady groove, um, and I think as you kind of move into the test, then it becomes kind of more said with yourself as well, Rob, mm. um, was that ideally we'd have done this a little bit longer. So we mm. might have used kind of smaller intervals, um, smaller steps even, and longer intervals because it, we wanted to mimic more of your um, sport specificity and, and the amount of time that you're going to spend on the bike. Mm. Uh, but we did have kind of time constraints on that yeah. day as well. So I think what you'd see if we did that and made it longer is a much smoother kind of just gradual climb there as well for sure. Yeah, nice. And so with the, obviously, I think it was just a really good point that you mentioned about like the hyperventilating and it, this is kind of where Ash and myself discussed this in previous episodes and like especially when you go within the world of CrossFit if you go out too hard too fast and your breathing rate goes up so hard to try and recover during a workout when you're hyperventilating you can just see and like this is like a graph that shows the inefficiency of that that the heart rate as soon as then my 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 I start hyperventilating becomes very inefficient and then I just obviously I hit a wall and crash which is then when you then take this within the world of CrossFit or even then obviously in the endurance world is as soon as you can't hit as soon as you lose control of your breathing you're you're on a ticking time bomb yeah yeah exactly and I think like it's nice to compare these two graphs side by side to see that so um as, as we kind of said, what we see on that VO2 is that gradual increase over time. And for the most part, we see that with the breathing frequency. And then right at the end, breathing frequency shoots up and you'd expect O2 to not, and it to you'd expect O2 to follow that pattern and go up as well. And it doesn't, which is kind of hammering that where it's like, okay, you're breathing faster, but you're not pulling in any more oxygen. So what's the point in breathing faster? And then obviously you're playing catch up and boom, you uh, crash and finish there. Is that related to the... Um, carbon dioxide, Luke, in that everyone talks about hyperventilating basically changes the diffusion gradient so you don't actually exchange the oxygen with the hemoglobin as efficiently on the shallower breaths compared to actually letting some carbon dioxide build up and have that exchange happen. I believe so. You're probably more in tune to that world than I am at the minute, but there will definitely be kind of a relationship there with carbon dioxide. I'm going to talk about carbon dioxide in a minute as well when we get to um, talking about the, the hemoglobin and the blood flow trend there as well. Perfect. Cool. Which leads us on to mm -hmm. the blood flow trend, right? So um, everything that we've kind of covered there with Rob was all about his uh, lung capacity and his respiratory function. So the kind of three things that I like to look for in these tests are respiratory function, cardiac function, and then oxygen utilization. So if we were kind of scoring Rob on his respiratory function, we'd probably be in a decent position because as we sort of said, although he hyperventilates, it's not till right at the end, which is kind of expected anyway. So it's not necessarily a huge limiter there. Um, I think the limiters that we saw with Rob were much more to do with um, oxygen utilization as opposed to kind of oxygen delivery. So we're going to come down and have a look at that on the graph now as well. So what we kind of look at using the MOXIE, as Ash kind of said earlier, it, it uses infrared spectroscopy to look at uh, the oxygen carrying molecules of hemoglobin and myoglobin. So hemoglobin is the molecule in the blood that carries oxygen. Myoglobin is a molecule in the muscles that basically stores oxygen at the muscle for use. And so we're able to look at using the MOXI total hemoglobin to the muscle, which is a good kind of indicator of blood supply to the muscle. And then that muscle oxygen saturation, which as we kind of touched upon earlier is about that supply and demand. So we can see kind of if that muscle oxygen saturation drops, we can see that, hey, the muscle is using more oxygen than it is being supplied. And we see that um, obviously with Rob in this test as you'd expect with any test as the intensity increases so we're going to dive into that now um so for those of you that are not on youtube and aren't necessarily looking at the graphs um what we've got is we've got kind of two lines on this graph that we're looking at now so one is total hemoglobin one is muscle oxygen saturation 
And in the warm-up, they're both nice and relatively stable. And then when the test starts, what we see is we see this muscle oxygen saturation gradually start to come down until you get to kind of higher intensities when it drops down a fair amount. And so that is measured as a percentage, and it's looking at the percentage of oxygen carrying molecules there. Um, then we see in this recovery, we see muscle oxygen saturation shooting straight back up, which is awesome because it means that, okay, cool, when he's recovered, like Robin to still deliver a lot of oxygenated blood to that muscle to try and fulfill that oxygen there and recover, which is ace. Like the timing there is good. The rebound's really good. What we see with total hemoglobin, which is nice and interesting, and we, we saw it a little bit with Ash as well, but kind of at different times, which we're going to dive into, which is super cool, um, is we see hemoglobin being relatively stable across the test. And then kind of just as he gets towards the end and in the recovery, we see total hemoglobin basically coming up and so that is basically a sign of one of two things either be to kind of constriction sorry sorry like, could you sorry could you repeat that so what is one of two things what was it what, what were they one or two things, ACE. And so that kind of rise in total hemoglobin that we see towards the end of a test will either be to do with kind of a um, venous constriction. So blood is basically just pooling at the muscle and can't necessarily clear. And that'll be to do with kind of the muscle cramping up. I don't think that is the case with Rob, just because it kind of started to happen very close to the end. Didn't necessarily talk about too much of a pump Um maybe right at the end, but it's more a case of to do with probably just some vasodilation, which is probably caused by a buildup of CO2. So CO2 is a vasodilator. And when we're respiring anaerobically, CO2 um, or aerobically as well, CO2 is a byproduct, right? And so the more CO2 that is kind of present, the more um, the blood vessels are going to expand and allow blood flow. To so I think that because we kind of see this in the recovery phase um, with Rob, I think that's basically a case of vasodilation and more blood flow coming to the muscle, which is ACE, because you kind of need that. And in the recovery, we see that kind of coupled with this rise in muscle oxygen saturation as well. So more oxygen is being delivered, um, and that is likely a case of that vasodilation, which is good. That tends to happen for anyone that, that is training kind of move into this high intensity. Mm. The interesting thing and the thing that we kind of spotted to work on with Rob here was his ultimately his ability to use oxygen. Um, and this is kind of based on the fact that his muscle oxygen saturation started at 80%, which is nice and high. Um, it's higher than what Ash has started at, which we're going to get to obviously. And, and the differences there are to do with the different modality test. Uh, but Rob then brings so, kind sorry, of his mate, muscle oxygen. What, what are the differences to do with? To do with, uh, so you and Rob had different kind of starting SMO2 values. So Rob started at around about 80%. Uh, Ash has started at around at about 60%. And ultimately, Ash was doing this test on a assault bike. And so he had the upper body, lower body aspect of it. And so there was kind of oxygenated blood wanting to flow both up to his arms to do the pumping on the assault bike and down to his legs. And so muscle oxygenation is likely going to be lower for one muscle group on that because there's oxygenated blood elsewhere. Whereas with Rob, it was on the bike. So the only real kind of exercising muscles were the legs, which was where the moxie was measuring from. And so we sort of see a higher starting SMO2 because of that, because in terms of priority of um, oxygenated blood, like it doesn't need to worry about going to the arms too much. Obviously, there's always going to be some, but um, more was kind of flowing to the legs because it was just the legs that were working. Um, and we had a nice chat about that afterwards in terms of, Rob himself claimed he was a very inefficient man. And so if he were doing kind of other mixed modality stuff, how efficient would his body be at pumping kind of oxygenated blood elsewhere, which would be a really interesting thing to look at. Um, but in this instance, the kind of main limiter that we sort of saw with Rob was a case of his oxygen saturation came from 80 down to about sort of 25% on this graph. Mm. which basically means that there's still 25% of um, hemoglobin, myoglobin molecules at the blood that are carrying oxygen that his muscles technically still could have used and didn't. So there's still kind of oxygen that's being pulled there that, that wasn't necessarily used before he kind of gave up for whatever reason. And so mm. for Rob, it could be a case of looking at increasing the efficiency of using the oxygen that is delivered there ultimately, um, which I think would be the main limiter there for you for sure. 
Yeah, what I found interesting is because obviously with the wearing that mask, I had to breathe solely through my mouth and I remember how dry my mouth started to get and it just, so I know when I'm on the bike normally doing any efforts that I make such a conscious effort now after the effort to not pant and take big deep breaths in through my nose, out through my mouth to try and bring my heart rate back down and I also try and hold my breath for a moment so I take a big deep breath in through the nose, hold it then exhale to try and bring my heart and also then obviously with like the saturation of getting all the oxygen getting that basically my recovery time to reduce so i can go again but obviously when you're wearing that mask it was it's very hard because obviously i shouldn't be doing that i should be breathing through through the mouth so my the normal way of me recovering so that extra 25 percent does make me think is that then without the that added on is that when I, I might not be able to get, say, down to, say, 10%, but it, do I have an extra 10% I could access to if I wasn't wearing that, getting my breathing, when I start to get really intense, when I am just panting, basically, so. I, potentially, interesting what we kind of see is a semi kind of plateau here at the end here. If mm. this kind of fully plateaued, then I'd say, regardless of how your breathing is, you're not necessarily going to be able to extract anymore if it plateaued because there was kind of this little extra dip as well. Mm. Then, hey, potentially there will still be a little bit more that right. you can probably use, but I still think that it would be something for yourself to improve on for sure in oh, terms yeah. of that um, utilization. So to do that, um, obviously there's kind of a couple of things that you can look at from a nutrition point of view and then from a training point of view as well, right? So in well you can use the oxygen at so you've got basically the capillary density of that muscle i think i've stopped there yeah so so you said there was two there was two things that we could obviously with nutrition and training so the what the, what the those things that i could i could do to help obviously improve my performance yeah so to improve that kind of oxygen utilization what we want to focus on doing is improving the capillary density at that muscle. So that will, of course, help uh, improve kind of oxygen transfer from the blood to the muscle, uh, which would be super useful. And so some zone two training, doing long, low and slow training with that can definitely help. And then the other side of things is um, increasing the amount of mitochondria there. So mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell there where aerobic respiration takes place. Um, and we can increase that again through some low zone two kind of training for sure. Um, and then the efficiency at kind of the aerobic enzyme reactions. And so from a nutrition point of view, there's kind of certain vitamins and minerals that are cofactors in those reactions. So B vitamins is a huge one that um, obviously seen on the side of a Red Bull that says, hey, B vitamins that mm. contribute to energy and prevent fatigue, blah, blah, blah. They're involved in those reactions, right? So if you've got a potential B vitamin deficiency for whatever reason, then they might not necessarily be helping there. Uh, nitrates are an interesting one as well. Nitrates, again, they help with vasodilation, which will help with kind of oxygen um, carrying capacity there to the muscle itself. But they've also been proven to uh, improve the efficiency of those reactions as well. So nitrates, so beetroot, that's what everyone's always chugging uh, for endurance stuff. Like they've been shown to basically make the mitochondria are more efficient at producing energy per oxygen. So even if you're not necessarily utilizing all the oxygen there, if they're more efficient, then that will improve your capacity as well for sure. So there'd be some really useful stuff for yourself, Rob. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and there's also been some evidence around kind of fasted training as well, uh, bringing about those benefits. So periodizing your nutrition, those low zone two sessions, maybe doing a couple of those fasted, they amplify the adaptations that we've seen from zone two training as well. Nice. Nice. Really good. Really we talked interesting. about that more in our previous pod with you, didn't we, Luke? Mm. So everyone can check that indeed. out if you want to know more about the benefits of faster training and yeah. Nice. Training. That's really, really good. So um, just kind of to, to recap overall, my thankfully, oh, where I'm relatively in the mid, like quite general, is in like, with like like a lot of the general public, my Garmin data has been very close to this. So the the information that has kind of been extracted is there's nothing like out, uh, outlierish. So nothing that's a bit like oh hold on what's going on here. So it what this is now has done is like support my training going forward to make sure that I'm kind of doing the right stuff. Now just on this. 
we we mentioned about obviously with our training system uh, um, training zones so with our with the zone two stuff my top heart rate is uh, i think it said 133 beats per minute that's what yeah, see, so 134 then. 134 sorry so when when i go to 135 that's me essentially out of zone two so that means i'm now working too hard it's one of those where like you probably don't necessarily need to worry about that much right. if you're hitting kind of the 140s 150s then yeah you've probably gone up but right. if like do not panic whatsoever if you hit 135 or whatever it's kind of the average so you'd yeah. want the average in that um session to be between the zone two that we've got there so 127 to 134 if it goes over by like one don't write off that session as <laughs> i haven't done so too. all my adaptations yeah. are gone uh, yeah. And useful to have that kind of guidance for sure um but yeah yeah so so my, my 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 thing about that is just especially when it comes to running in particular that's is i i think i know ash and myself discussed this before and i know many people struggle with this zone two training because i think what most people struggle with is realizing how slow it actually is and to raise okay. your floor is in like to 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 work that slow feels like you're not doing enough but that's it's it's the skill in itself and i i think this just really shows that obviously with my lack so where i could improve is by doing more zone two stuff so it shows i work too hard too much and i'm never in that i'm either working either at too high intensity or in my endurance zone which but i need to be so i'm basically just working in this middle ground rather than then building up my foundations and building up my lower end which is then going to make my top end even better because i have a better bottom end so it's what i wanted to kind of get from seeing this was to kind of get the listeners to understand that zone two training for how much we joke about it being a myth and stuff it it's it's worth playing around with and but also then for understanding like you know making sure you have a heart rate belt making sure you're getting some good data and also getting your training zones you can get them online as estimated which can be a good place to start and then but you know obviously like hooking up with someone like luke and actually getting this test done can really uh, get some good insights so should we move on to ash go on then let's have a look so can I get my excuses out of the way? Before we, uh... <laughs> of course you can. Go on. I think everyone needs to understand that we had a top of the title, top of the table clash in seven aside football late the previous night, and uh, I clocked a record high strain and max heart rate. Not a great night of sleep with all the adrenaline in my system. Seven percent recovery on Whoop. So. <laughs> It's just important that all the listeners know that there's probably a little bit more in the tank and these are not representative of my absolute <laughs> max. <laughs> You've also got the benefit of uh, Rob did this on a C2, you did this on the assault bike. So there's kind of a couple of confounding factors that are going to take place as well, right? So Ash's legs yeah. probably got a little bit more pumped than Rob's. Yeah, I hope so. But mm. yeah, and and obviously, as you said, kind of the, uh, the heart rates you hit in um, seven or football uh, mostly due to adrenaline and having a scrap as opposed to actually work right <laughs> that's it it's the fight or flight but, but i think the first most important bit is the match com max maximal metrics which has <laughs> scored 48.1 and i scored 50.4 so uh there we go there you go another important <laughs> <laughs> another important thing to clear up for the listeners is luke actually called out that i'd hit 50 which was my target in my brain for uh what i wanted to score but the caveat is that you have to hold it for a sustained period of time and i was like okay i've done 50 now i can tap out but obviously that didn't carry through to my final <laughs> score which uh you know i'm sure there's a bit more in the tank if uh, i know that was the case <laughs> just means you'll have a better yeah, one next so, time right <laughs> exactly. exactly i just want to show more improvement exactly. stuff to improve on exactly that's a, a good point to make though there um is the distinction between vo2 peak and vo2 max so VO2 max, which has been measured here, is that sustained um, oxygen consumption, whereas VO2 peak is kind of like, oh, look, one breath he took in loads of oxygen, but he didn't sustain it. So we did see that when that flashed up on the iPad. I apologize for saying, oh, we've broken 50, <laughs> but we had, we mm -hmm. had, but it was yeah. the VO2 peak yeah. as opposed to VO2 max. So, um, okay. yeah, but immediately kind of things to consider when we look at um, ashes, we sort of see that this maximal zone 
is almost putting him at a heart rate of um, higher than he reached in that test. And that is almost a case of um, the algorithm with the reporting system here, kind of seeing that based on the trend of the heart rate in the VO2, that Ash can take his heart rate up a little higher. Um, it's one of those as well where I wouldn't necessarily take this maximal heart rate zone of kind of 191 beats per minute as law. I think that um, there were some confounding factors that we chatted about, of course, within that test to do with the pump and the clearance of kind of waste products, mm. which I think is ultimately the um, the big issue that we saw with you, Ash, as opposed to Rob's kind of utilization. I think your clearance of waste is potentially going to be something that is... Um, more of a focus and so we've got kind of two different pictures there but we'll kind of do a similar thing where we run through kind of how you how you did it how you achieved we'll run through the protocol as well so ash's protocol was on an assault bike um and to make it more sport specific to ash's training which we kind of classed as crossfit although the amount of crossfit he does is minimal mm -hmm. it's very much kind of dips and pull-ups right but um exactly. he's not going to be sitting for a couple of hours on a bike like rob right so no. Because of that, we did this on an assault bike and um, intervals were two minutes long and we were taking the intensity up by five RPM as opposed to watts just because um, controlling watts on an assault bike is notoriously hard. And when you do take it up by five RPM on an assault bike, you kind of get a difference in watts that's anywhere between sort of 30 watts and 50 or 60, depending. Obviously, you've got the exponential aspect there, but we get a decent um, indication of a ramp going up there, which is super useful as well. But we see very similar stuff from the start. So heart rate and VO2 both climb nice and evenly um, as we go. We also see the inefficiency of breathing at the high intensities. <laughs> so we see kind of respiratory frequency spike and VO2 not necessarily spike as well. But as we kind of said before, that's normal for anyone to be kind of at those high intensities, you're gonna have that spike. And this is why it's one of those where you're almost just wanting to delay that spike. And so diaphragmatic breathing and, and all that kind of stuff can definitely benefit for sure. I feel like there are very few people apart from maybe Wim Hof uh, that focus on breathing. And so pretty much everyone could probably improve that aspect, but it is normal for it to spike at higher intensities. One, uh, one so, question on that, Luke. Go on. Sorry to interrupt. Yep. Um, if the higher breathing frequency is less efficient and doesn't bring more oxygen in, why do we do it? Is it just like a panic response that actually doesn't help us? And would learning to override that panic response to breathe slower, deeper breaths and actually provide more oxygen be a strategy to overcome it? Yeah, as I kind of said earlier, you're probably more entrenched in this world than I am in terms of breathing patterns and that kind of thing. But I think without a doubt, definitely it is that kind of panic response. It's natural. Um, so learning to overcome that for sure and that is kind of the whole Wim Hof method right if we mm. wanted to dive into that sort of thing when you hit cold water cold water shock occurs and that panic of hyperventilating occurs and overcoming that focusing on your breathing um that's the the benefits from that side of thing right I've totally butchered that but you know no, what I mean? you're, no, that you're you're right as well and it's it's when it comes to like that panting essentially is that fight or flight and thing is when yep. you're in that state so you're not think you're not conscious of your breathing so you're going to be a lot more reactive to things around you and stuff like that so you, you think when they when you talk about like the fighting of the bear type thing so you're in that that state i guess it's you, you know you if you're it'd be a lot better if you are calmer taking big deep breaths because you can assess situations you can you can do a lot more you can think clearly but as soon as you then start hyperventilating it's just it has to be really quick and like easy decisions and I guess when it comes to training, this is what, as you say, what we're trying to do is trying to push our levels because what our body's trying to do is to stop us because we're obviously, we're stressing ourselves. Our body's like, stop stop it, you're hurting us. But we're obviously trying mm. to create adaptions so that our ceilings are raised so that we get better so our panting doesn't start until later on. So Exactly that. Yeah. There we go. So... Let's go on to the um, interesting bit that we found with Ash, um, and that is going to be the um, SMO2 and the hemoglobin one as well. So 
very similar graphs on the face of things when you look at it compared to Rob. So you see kind of hemoglobin nice and relatively steady across um, and then increase towards the end. The kind of key differences here are Rob's increase was happening in the cool down zone as opposed to there's a significant chunk of time where ash is working within the test thing at the higher intensities and hemoglobin is almost kind of shooting up there and it is shooting up afterwards as well. But the coupling of kind of hemoglobin increasing in those high intensities with kind of this muscle oxygen saturation still decreasing and then plateauing, basically combining that with uh, Ash's subjective data, which was him saying, getting a bit of a leg pump. Um, <laughs> That's an understatement. From that side of things, a, a, a huge, massive leg pump that felt like it was going to explode. There you go. How's that? Uh, yeah. That says More to accurate. me, ultimately, that whereas kind of, Rob, it was a case of, hey, the um, blood vessels are dilating because of the CO2 buildup and they're kind of applying a little bit more. I think with uh, Ash, there was a bit of occlusion potentially because of this kind of constriction of the leg muscles, which is preventing kind of that clearance and removal of waste products as well um so one of the waste products for example is uh, hydrogen ions that cause kind of the burn and um cause acidosis in the muscle which prevents kind of or reduces enzyme activity for aerobic reactions so in that situation what's going to happen is utilization is going to suffer as well right if clearance is um poor and these waste products are building up, they're going to interfere with the aerobic enzyme reactions that process oxygen and create energy. So I think with ash, it's a case of kind of like fixing that clearance issue. You're mm. going to see much more benefit um, than focusing on a utilization issue for sure. Uh, so the kind of subtle differences there are with Rob, it's like, hey, we want to just improve that um, efficiency. Hey, with Ash, we want to improve that as well. But the big thing kind of holding that back, I believe, is um, clearance and this buildup of waste products. And it kind of correlates with uh, your training at the minute, right, Ash? Because uh, mm. how often do you spend in these high intensities and with that burn? Uh, yeah, very little at the moment. I've not done anything of meaningful intensity in training except for the football matches. And I think it's interesting to note difference in like heart rate I, I definitely tapped out earlier than i probably should have done because i thought i'd hit 50 but on a serious note my heart rate only hit 188 in this test and the previous night i hit 196 so that from a sort of heart yeah heart rate point of view there's a bit more there but it was just my legs and my yeah my bottle gave out much oh. sooner um partly due to the assault bike uh, modality versus running which will be it, it like i'd like to get your thoughts on that as well luke you said something around the fact that because it's not my normal means of training it's going to be a bit harder for me to to reveal my true max can you dig into that a bit more please yeah so you're going to obviously kind of to use rob's word of him being an inefficient man you're probably going to be a little bit more inefficient on an assault bike the movement pattern's going to be a little bit different um and not necessarily be able to push the intensity as much because of that pump right so in terms of the context of this test you can kind of bring heart rate variability into it as well you said that you had a seven percent recovery score so that's saying <laughs> hey heart rate variability is going to be low which means that ultimately it's not necessarily going to be ready to respond to a certain kind of stress, especially one that it's not necessarily used to as an assault mm -hmm. bike. And so that to me says, hey, that's why you didn't reach that 196 because your body just wasn't in a state to do that because of kind of the low heart rate variability and recovery there. Um, but as we sort of said, like you're more used to running, you'll be able to push to a higher pace. There'll be less of a pump, less of a clearance issue because you're kind of more used to that and your muscles are more used to that um, activity level as well. So I think definitely your VO2 um, will be higher in that modality of running for sure. Mm. Um, yeah, it's just kind of a case of this is the test that we did on the assault bike. How can we improve it in terms of that uh, modality yeah. there? Yeah, I think that's an awesome distinction to draw for the listeners to appreciate the skill of the movement has a huge impact on how efficiently you can do it. So the things that you've practiced more, you'll be able to push your threshold higher than things that you're not so skilled at. And when you come to the sport of CrossFit, it's a massive, massive implication because if somebody's awesome at 
thrusters and pull-ups, they can push their heart rate super high in Fran. But if they're not, and they're actually all over the place with their thrusters and their yeah, their pull-ups technique is very sloppy, they're not actually going to be able to get the same training stimulus as somebody who is skilled. So trying to make your Metcons the conditioning piece is very dependent on your skill in the movements in that Metcon, mm -hmm. which is why the use of um, monostructural stuff is still prevalent in CrossFit because people are able to push their threshold further in lower skill workouts than, you know, doing like a snatch muscle up workout for a lot of people. They're not going to get much of a heart rate or conditioning stimulus as compared to the things that they're more uh, used to doing and better and more efficient at. For sure. Exactly. And that's why we do this on the uh, assault bike as well is you've got the, um, kind of upper body, lower body stimulus that you're going to get from CrossFit. Very rarely in CrossFit do you just sit and have like a single modality workout where there's just one exercising muscle group. Um, and then obviously kind of you get the intended stimulus and the time domain of CrossFit workouts as well, right? So most CrossFit Metcons are going to be 10 to 20 minutes in length. Um, and the assault bike kind of is the best way to replicate that and control the intensity of it. Um, it'd be interesting mm -hmm. to kind of develop some more CrossFit specific protocols. That's something that we're looking at doing and um, to look at other kind of aspects of performance for sure. But for now, the assault bike in terms of CrossFit is the best one we've got and the most sport specific for sure. Nice. Awesome. Cool. Right. We need to tell Ash how to improve his uh, clearance as well real quick, yeah. don't we? Desperate to know. <laughs> there we go. So, Ash, in terms of improving that, you unfortunately have to put yourself in those situations a little bit more. Um, so, yeah, training-wise, that would be one, definitely. And it's a case of, hey, we want you to get better at um, desaturating and resaturating. So it'll be that high-intensity training. And now we've kind of got indicators as to how intense that needs to be. And we've got indicators mm -hmm. in terms of time as to how quick you can resaturate your muscles with oxygen. And you can almost use that as a rest period. Uh, from a nutrition point of view, obviously kind of Matt Fraser went on Joe Rogan and started talking about beta alanine, but beta alanine is mm -hmm. one of those that can help kind of delay this buildup of the waste products. So where we saw kind of your clearance of waste products is potentially the issue. If you can delay that buildup, then boom, that performance is going to increase as well. So using buffers like beta alanine, sodium bicarb is another one, but you always need to put a uh, caveat with sodium bicarb because it makes people food themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, Wearing <laughs> And then just... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So nappy and sodium bicarb. Um, and then another <laughs> potential potential one from a training point of view, and you guys, as I say, you're the um, the coaches here. I'm just the nutritionist with the cool testing kit, is uh, mm. potentially an interaction of more kind of blood flow restriction work, right? Um, to almost create that waste product build up a little bit more, like you're putting yourself in that situation, being able to deal with it, but the load on the joints will obviously be a little low and it can be a good way to sort of condition the specific muscle, right? Am I right in saying that? Obviously mm. you guys are the experts. Yeah, definitely. So there's, there's the sort of metabolic adaptation component and this has been a thing in endurance sport for a little while. If somebody can't get their workout in, you hear stories of people who've got say busy city jobs and they just do a 12 minute wall sit just to let all those byproducts build up, feel that burn, and you can still train your muscle cells to deal with that situation without doing a sort of normal workout. Obviously, the most sport-specific is to recreate the situation as closely as possible. So doing intervals and getting into that sucky zone where it really hurts, recovering, and then doing it again, that's way more functional. But the metabolic adaptation can be achieved without necessarily doing a full-on training session in other ways. And I think BFR, uh, blood flow restriction, does seem to be bridging the gap, even um, though it's traditionally being viewed as like a bodybuilding and rehab tool, the other applications are being seen in the uh, performance world as well. Mm. I think it's go. definitely as so more, now more endurance people are starting to look into, especially where the transition happens now, you know, with where you've got CrossFitters, looking to say that I say strength athletes mainly and then they're trying to improve their endurance world like it's the hybrid isn't it when you start now getting these strength athletes say going into the endurance world actually will this help me there 
So then, the, you know, it becomes then a lot of um, practical application that you can start to see these things bridging the gap. Definitely, definitely. So now I'm going to be disappointed if Ash isn't doing all his podcasts in a wall sit now. <laughs> a wall sit wearing cuffs on all four limbs. There we and, go, uh, exactly. Yeah, with short rest periods. I think, uh, like, for me, this is fascinating because I've always viewed myself as, um, like, a, an athlete who prefers higher intensities and have always been averse to long, steady state aerobic work. And I think whether it's the complacency around that or the fact that I have actually started doing a bit more aerobic, lower intensity stuff, that my strengths and weaknesses are actually the opposite of what I thought. And the stuff that I, I enjoy, the high intensity intervals, which is part of the reason why I backed away from them is like I kind of got that. And whenever I play sport, I'm quite happy operating in a very high heart rate zone for extended periods of time. But using this test, having the data to show me that that is actually my limiter from getting fitter um, has real tangible takeaways for me and how I'm going to change my training going forwards. For the main thing is I now feel like I can do less zone two boring stuff that I don't like in favor of the intervals, which I do like. And it's, it's really interesting looking back on my training and the times when I felt fittest have been when I do most intervals and intellectually, I've thought, right, I need to work on my aerobic base because that's the thing I've always avoided all of my life. But that's not actually the limiting factor for me. So doing more of the stuff I actually enjoy will have a greater carryover to my fitness. And yeah, I'm definitely going to be taking that on board, changing my training to smash the retests and break that 50. <laughs> yeah, there we go. A 12-week assault bike program where you're just doing intervals <laughs> and we'll be up in the 60s. Absolutely grim. Yeah. Nice. So, this as um, for our listeners that may not say have access to this VO2 master and the Moxie test, or that is there anything that they can do to kind of get an understanding of what's going on in their body, so that, that give them so, uh, so see how Ash was limited through clearance and I was limited just through how I was limited through. So, is there is there anything that our listeners can do without that? that kit yeah so obviously with yourself kind of the, the garmin was quite an interesting one in mm. terms of telling you kind of where your vo2 is at and the heart rate zones being kind of close to what we found them to be mm. um and for kind of the general population that tends to be the case with garmin's and stuff like that it tends to be relatively accurate so um just using that kind of stuff and making sure that if you are good at high intensity stuff hey, maybe you should probably do some more zone two stuff, right? But not necessarily going too far down the rabbit hole like Ash might have done um, and totally neglect that kind of zone two stuff, <laughs> uh, high intensity stuff even. Um, yeah. But it's one of those where subjectively, like you'll be able to kind of know, like there'll be people listening that are probably thinking like, oh man, I get a huge old pump the moment like intensity goes above thing. My breathing frequency spikes the moment I'm doing kind of, high intensity stuff and it's one of those where like everything that we've talked about with regards to diaphragmatic breathing and um beta alanine buffers that sort of stuff could be relevant to you based on subjectively how you feel during certain workouts mm. so subjectively if you feel like in the longer lower slow ones it's very hard for you to keep that up and keep that heart rate down then hey guess what do more of that mm. um and then you know work kind of like stuff like nitrates into your diet um but yeah, it's one of those where like polarized training, I think is something super useful for kind of everyone to do. So that's this kind of idea of doing load slow stuff and doing super high intensity stuff on different days. So you don't necessarily get kind of any interference effects. But if you're kind of stuck in the middle, like um, Rob, you said, you know, sometimes you're, it creeps into that endurance zone and you're doing yeah. too much of that kind of middle of the road stuff. It can be easier to kind of just strip it back and think, hey, I'm going to do a lot of low and slow and a lot of super high intensity mm -hmm. and uh, polarize it. So different days, I think that's something that pretty much anyone is going to benefit from. Um, and then from a nutrition point of view as well, it's one that we have put together the engine program, engine nutrition program. There you mm -hmm. go. Got to throw in a plug every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> but that's basically similar to this kind of polarized training aspect. We've split it into two phases where we've got nutrition to improve aerobic base, nutrition to improve that kind of anaerobic stuff and looking at them separately, periodizing your nutrition based on the uh, adaptations you want to create. So if you, like Ash, um, 
get super pumpy and want to do some high intensity stuff, then that kind of nutrition for anaerobic stuff is going to be making sure that you have plenty of um, glycogen. So very kind of high carb uh, and making sure that you're fueling for those workouts with pre and post workout that you're taking on those buffers as well. Um, if you're kind of the opposite and you're looking to improve aerobic capacity because you don't do zone two stuff, you can't hang out in zone two without your heart rate, then you're comfy sort of thing. Um, it's a case of potentially working to improve metabolic flexibility. So again, this fueling for the work required, which we talked a lot about in that endurance nutrition one. So it'd be a good one for people to go back and listen to for sure there. Mm. Yeah, something that I found um, really interesting was, and especially for the listeners that may not have access to this kit, is if you're not sure where your VO2 like max is or when you're in that zone, and we've mentioned obviously about breathing frequency, but being conscious of like your breathing when you're training this, especially when you're doing any type of endurance work, is 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 key. Because if, if you're just mindlessly running and then just suddenly, oh, fuck, it's hard now. It's like you, it, it's, you're kind of missing a trick because yesterday when I was on the bike erg, I, I, it, I felt the switch. I felt it go from I have control of my breathing to literally just then I am now going. <gasps> and, I, I, and I couldn't do anything about that. And that was where, you know, that's where you're at your, your, my limit. So it was really interesting to kind of see that. And then also the type of lifter I am. So when it comes to my strength training and stuff like that, being the more of a power lifter, enjoy that kind of like short, sharp stuff. Kind of like Ash said about like he enjoys the, the sprint side of things, but I enjoy the powerful stuff, not the long and slow stuff. And that massively kind of showed in the, the test is in, even though I'm, I was quite comfortable say pushing up the 50 watts and because I do a lot of say threshold work and so so I'm comfortable ish around there but then as soon as I went a little bit over threshold it was just, just like bang okay that's where you then hit the wall and when I was and the day before I did this vo2 test I was then doing it via running and I was supposed to be hitting a vo2 pace and going through that pace I could just instantly then feel my heart rate go to the point where it was out of control and on the lot I was doing four intervals and on that fourth one it's like to where I felt a little bit sick and just like because I'd push myself to that limit so and that was before I had the data and I was using that was you and my so my running vo2 was based on I worked out what my average threshold is for say my 5k so what my um, threshold pace is and then I detract to say 30 seconds roughly so 20, 30 seconds. And so I didn't need numbers to work off that. But now that I've got this data, it now gives me a little bit more say, okay, you're actually working within the right kind of realm. So for our listeners, something I wanted to really make, make a takeaway from this is you can get these numbers, uh, you can get by without these numbers, but having these numbers gives you a really good idea if you're doing it right. And I think you put out a post on Instagram recently about how the number is pointless didn't you? Could yep. you just dive into that a little bit? Yeah, so the number of VO2 max, as as we kind of touched on there, is is pointless. It'll tell you if you're fit or not fit or somewhere in the middle, but like it doesn't give you any actionable data to work on because mm. if it's low, you don't know why it's low, right? And obviously, if it's very low, then just training is going to bring it up for sure, like definitely just training and, and uh, as Rob said, kind of being guided by the... Uh, heart rate training zones that you might have on a Garmin that are estimations for you will be super useful. Um, but when you kind of get to the spot where you guys are at and you're taking training a lot more seriously and you want to look at, okay, why is that low? Why is that score that? What's holding it back from kind of increasing? That's when um, maybe you do need to dive into a little bit more, get some tests done and look at kind of what's under the hood and what's holding you back. But as I say, it's one of those where as with pretty much everything, if you get kind of too bogged down in, uh, am I training right, blah, 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 then you might just sort of stop training, lose the fun in training. And the most important thing is training. Mm. Showing yeah. up. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. I've got a question. Yeah. Got a question on beta alanine, please, Luke. Um, <laughs> when you take beta alanine, does that improve your performance in just that session? or will it carry over? So it obviously buffers, so you don't feel that burn build up quite so much. So in that one training session, you'll be able to perform better. And in competition, you'll be able to perform better while you're using it. Does that blunt the adaptation? And does it 
does it build a dependence on taking it? Not necessarily. It's one of those where um, beta alanine, if you take it for a one-off session, you probably aren't going to see the buffering effects immediately. Okay. Um, it's one of those where ultimately what beta alanine does is it uh, increases the carnosine content in the muscle. And the carnosine um, is what's actually going to be buffering the hydrogen ions and preventing that kind of buildup of acid ultimately. Um, so it's one of those where you ideally want to be taking it kind of consistently for a couple of weeks to like see creatine. the effects massively like creatine there we go exactly it's that kind of build up effect um with beta alanine what you'll probably get if you take it as a one-off is a bit of a you'll feel the tingles you'll feel like i'm ready to go mm -hmm. and so you're probably going to perform better <laughs> in that session anyway but the method of action is not yeah. going to be kind of what the beta alanine is actually looked into for um the way that I like to kind of advise on B2-alanine is um, similar to kind of what you said there with regards to, hey, will it blunt the adaptation? Probably not. Can you become dependent on it? Maybe. The way that I sort of recommend people do it is like, hey, in competition season, make sure you're taking it consistently kind of for four weeks leading up to it and throughout that competition. But you don't necessarily need it when you're not in competition season, right? You kind of want to almost peak similarly to as you would be training and deload and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it's one of those that, that is super useful um, in certain scenarios. And if you just want to turn up and be a beast every day, then, hey, take it consistently for sure. Um, but you won't necessarily recognize kind of the distinction between um, which people kind of want and need sometimes, yeah. right, as well. They want to know that something's working. Whereas if you're taking it every day, you lose that kind of idea of, hey, yeah, this is really working for me. Yeah, I used to, well, I take it daily with um, just an electrolyte tablet. So because it's just, I like to yeah. say sip on it. Um, one of, Someone I used to work with, actually, one of the listeners of the podcast, Adam, he um, did a mental thing of putting his in with his whey protein. And I just, I couldn't, because of the itchy face feeling, I'm like, just imagine drinking whey protein, scratching my face. It just, for me, I associate beta alanine with workout. I just, <laughs> I couldn't, I, I never understood how he did that, but he did. And it's, um, it's I've definitely, I, I'd love to know if taking it has helped my training as like, you know, like, mm. as like the idea of what had the buffering effect, like, well, would you say that with my results? Would you say that it's it helps? It's worth it? at least. It's probably worth at least three points on the VO two max. Oh yeah, probably. Take <laughs> probably. Yeah. probably. Take it away. And you're forty eight point four, which is point one less than that. Uh, I tell you, because kind of we didn't see the um, increase in like hemoglobin whilst you were training. It was more in the recovery section. Yeah. Then potentially, like that says to me that hey, like the 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 burning wasn't necessarily there. Uh, the uh, issue with regards to kind of utilization wasn't necessarily there that we saw with Ash. So mm. immediately we're saying, hey, Ash, basically take your B2 alanine. Mm. And there's your three points. It. Mm -hmm. That's it, yeah. I'm really interesting, mate. I really appreciate it. Thank you for today. And thank you for taking us through the test. That was, it's a really good insight. And I do, I, I look forward to doing the retest. And ideally I'd do it closer to say, back end of summertime where I'm a little bit more peaked shall we say because I, I think that would be such an interesting to see how much the improvement because obviously now with my polarized training trying to now with this clear um clear insight saying I need to do more zone two stuff so you know I, I re I'm going to put a real focus on that lower end work to, and it'll be really interesting to see how much and uh, get you back on and maybe run through some other bits as well. So thank you very much for your time doing that. And thanks for this. No worries whatsoever, guys. Awesome. Thank you very much thanks. for having me on. Our pleasure, mate. Thank you again. And if people want to know more about the test or potentially book in, where do they find details of that? Ace, yeah. So you find details on the PH Nutrition website. So we've got a whole page now for the... Um, metabolic testing and as uh, ash said right at the beginning we're running it out of wit house london so wit um the flagship store down there and we're doing testing slots on a wednesday afternoon and then on a saturday they are the times that are available to kind of book in and get it done so the ph nutrition website and the metabolic testing page there amazing so awesome. well i uh, thank you <laughs> thank you very much and again we hope you got some little nuggets to take away for your own training today. 
thank you very much as always for taking the time to listen to us it's we really appreciate the feedback that we've been getting and uh yeah thank you again we the more the more this is growing hopefully the more guests we can get on and it's yeah we've got some nice big plans for the future and uh we, we're really glad you're here for the ride with us so thanks for taking the time um as always do leave a review if you can it really does help us grow and reach others share it on instagram and all that lot um but yeah thanks a lot for your time and we'll see you next week Thanks, guys.